Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Kurt Schilling Baseball Show, episode 36 already. My goodness. Uh, I'm Kurt Schilling, and he is Bill Graff. Good afternoon, Bill. How are we doing, buddy? We're doing very well, Kurt. Happy to be uh, sitting here in the United States watching baseball. Yes. In the in, <laughs> Nice that you mentioned the United States, because we're actually going to go out of country to start this one off. The Cubs and Cardinals, uh, a great series. And I got to believe... Uh, St. Louis and Chicago fans were pissed because this is a, a centuries-old rivalry they love to be a part of. They moved it over to uh, to England for uh, a two-game set, which I'm going to tell you, as nice as that is for fans, it sucks for players. Um, the two-game set traveling and all those things go with it, but they got to go to London, so it had to be pretty cool. Uh, 55,565 a game. Um well, probably only because there's no soccer being played, but uh, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know if London's a market. Um, I mean, if you think about it, Bill, the flight from East Coast to West Coast and vice versa is generally four to six hours. Yeah, probably um, from the middle of the country at six. Right, right. But I'm saying from East to West right now in the schedule, right. if I'm in New York and we go to play LA, we're making a five hour flight, six right. hours flight whatever we're trying in three time zones i don't know that a london team is that unrealistic and i say that for this reason <clears throat> because generally what you would do is tie a, a west coast trip to the east coast to to london and back to the east coast and back right would, you, could, you could do that inside of a big league schedule the challenge would be for the london team to play a california team in a schedule but as baseball looks to expand in its audience, I wonder if that isn't something they're contemplating as a, a potential landing spot. Same with Mexico, although you got to probably make a lot of arguments about safety and security and all things going on down in Mexico. But uh, that 110,000 fans for two games is yeah. That's great. The thing, the thing, the hard part for me is the five-hour time differential. Right. Right. And yeah, that yeah. adjustment. Right. Because nine times out of 10, I, I'm pretty sure in the collective bargaining agreement, anytime you have to make uh, a move from east to west or west to east, I believe it is, you have to have an off day. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, someone had been talking about and we were talking about and we've talked about uh, home road splits for pitchers. And there are some young pitchers that have that have really bad. Zach Gallon's one of them. Um, Arizona home road splits. Uh, and I was that way early in my career. And then I learned <clears throat> when I learned about nutrition and taking care of yourself, I began to fly ahead of the team, uh, for different road trips. Uh, I would go out two days early to the West coast, uh, and adjust over two days because the thought was always, if the team is tired, it's okay. If the starting pitcher's not, you can win a game two to nothing. If the starting pitcher's not fatigued, like the rest of the team and there is fatigue, I, you know, it is what it is. Um, but I would fly ahead uh, a couple days or if, if we had a night game, for example, in Boston, a lot of times we had a Sunday night game against the Yankees. Uh, if I were pitching Monday or Tuesday on the road, I would fly out Saturday because the Sunday night game would take till midnight, one o'clock. They wouldn't get in until three or four a.m. on the West Coast. So you do, you start to do as you get older, you start to understand that there are certain things you can do to increase your odds. And that was the thing. It wasn't a team thing. It was the fact that they're paying me to win games. And so I'm going to put myself in a position, the best possible position, health and nutrition wise to win a game. And that would preclude normal travel schedules and teams were fine with it. And then it's one of those things where if your fifth starter, who's three and four with a nine ERA asks, you're like, yeah, well, dude, it's not really going to matter. But if, if the guy who is leading your staff and is, and you know, is a guy who pays attention and all the things that go with that, <clears throat> you're going to listen. And I, and I did that for the last half of my career. I traveled like that all the time. And it was, like I said, basically the most important thing was for me to make sure that I was ready to go. You know, you have a day game Tuesday in Anaheim coming out of a, a, a midnight finish on Sunday night in, in Boston or New York, you're getting into California at two, three, 4 AM. Um, and it's taken a couple of days for your body to recover. And and it didn't for the pitcher. So interesting to 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 think along those lines. But uh, a kid we talked about early. Remember Jordan Walker? We were talking about him early. Bill. He was you know couldn't make an out, and then couldn't get a hit. Went back to the minor leagues. He's now got a 15 game hitting streak. And for you Cardinal fans, 
he's one of those guys that generally he'll, he'll find his way. He's that talented, I think, in the, in the times that I've seen him. I think um, he'll be fine. And I think that the probably the generally, I think when you see a young player get sent down and come back through a little adverse, because that's a big deal. This is generally when a player like Jordan Walker gets set down, it's the first time in his life he's ever been given a setback on the baseball field or in the, in the sports arena. And some guys that can crush and other guys it motivates. And he clearly, he figured it out and got, got, got after it. And he's now back to being the player and that they thought he would. And this is a kind of a cool note. Um, and it's probably something uh, anytime you're the first player ever to do something in baseball, you guys have heard me say this, but Paul Goldsmith became the first player in history to play in five different countries, USA, Canada, England, Australia, and Mexico regular season game in five different countries, which I think is a very cool thing. Um, I'm not a, so I, I remember in 08, we opened up in Japan um, and we flew over like a week early and all the things that go with that. And and I thought that for the position players, I thought that that sucked. Uh, it's a great experience in the, in the off season traveling with the major league baseball team. But when the games count and you're playing for a world series, I don't like that stuff. That doesn't, you know, that, probably makes me the old codger more than anything and i'm sure guys love this stuff but there's a i think there's a competitive disadvantage to doing that if it's not done right from a scheduling perspective and um so i was never a big fan of it i did like going to the other markets um but so there uh cardinals cubs england success next year mets phillies are going to do it um so basically what that will mean was there will be the average number of fist fights in the stands will go down because the Mets Philly series will be playing outside of the United States. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and then, uh, so let's, let's jump over to Tampa. And um, I had an experience with a player and uh, not an experience with a player, but I watched it happen uh, live one time. Uh, Andrew Jones got pulled in the middle of a game by Bobby Cox. And I remember uh, for, for basically being lazy. And uh, I remember sitting next to Andrew uh, on the Japan trip. We were going over to Japan. And I remember Andrew saying that it was one of the most uh, impactful events of his career. Um, and I say this because w Wanda Franco got benched for two games. Um, and what a, I, I can't think of many things worse to be said about me as a player quote unquote, for not being the best teammate. Um, that that would be so crushing. Um, but he got benched for two days and uh, all self-inflicted, in, in, um, by the way. Um, manager Kevin Cash declined to discuss by Franco's bench. You don't have to discuss it. We all watched it. We know. Um, when guys half pass it on the field, they should be benched. Um, and he was, uh, he said, it's been really, really hard not being with the team. I'm happy to be back. It's been difficult. He comes back Saturday homers and adds a single. Um, and then he went on to say, I, I, I'd be better to control my emotions and just find a way to help the team. I've just got to be able to control the situation because I know they're my problem. I'm just here to play baseball and I've got to control my emotions. Yes. That's what you do it for. Um, this kid is uh, a special, special player. He's got a $182 million, 11 year contract. He's 22 years old. Um, hopefully this is it. Hopefully this doesn't happen again. Uh, you should have enough pride. You're totally embarrassed. Uh, not, not for the fans, even though it is embarrassing, but to the guys you're suiting up with the guys you're dressing with and tra traveling with and living with for nine months a year. That's the embarrassing thing. Uh, having it publicly called out that you're not playing as hard as your teammates should be incredibly soul crushing to the point you never let it happen again. It'll be interesting uh, to see how it does affect him as well. Like well, you and, said with Andrew you Jones. Hope, right. Yeah. No, what, right. What you hope is that you do it with someone so supremely talented to get the message across Two two messages. Number one, I don't care how good you are. You, you have to play the game the way I tell you to play the game. Number one. And number two, you don't think there's 25 other guys in that locker room who aren't as good as him saying, well, listen, if that dude's going to get benched, then I could get cut. I could get sent out. It, 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 it is the, you can't let the inmates run the asylum. And Kevin Knight Cash, I think, did a fantastic job of handling this. Um, and along those lines, 
uh, we had another situation, uh, not a situation, but it's, it's something to discuss. Um, Aaron Donaldson has been uh, talking about a couple of different things. And, and there's uh, some comments he made the other day about possibly playing beyond this year, if, if he would or wouldn't play beyond this year. Um, and he's, it was after he sat out three days. Uh, and then he met with Aaron Boone. And this is where I think Aaron Boone – uh, is better than most guys in the big leagues. His ability, he, he's just a phenomenal communicator. Um, and his players, uh, I guarantee you, would cut throats for him. Uh, and the, the the comments around the, the discussion, Boone said that he and Donaldson are now, quote, on the same page. Donaldson will be playing a lot. Donaldson said, quote, unquote, just a lot of ball talk. And I guarantee it was. It wasn't about, hey, why am, why am I not playing? I think it was probably a matter of Booney just saying, hey, listen, dude, here's how I'm going to manage this team. Here's where you're going to be needed for us. Here's what I need from you. You're a veteran player, uh, you know, with, with our, our, our leaders out of the lineup. You know, you guys like Aaron, uh, 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 Josh Donaldson are, are leaders, whether they're on the field or not. And he plays with an intensity and with a style that doesn't sit on the bench very well. Understandable and fine, but you have to accept and understand your role within the concept and scope of what the team is trying to accomplish. And they're trying to win a World Series. Your bats are going to come. And, and and it gets frustrating. And, and, you know, unfortunately, he's in a town with some of the most horrific sports media on the planet uh, who will make something out of nothing and, and, uh, and do a lot of embellishing. Um, but... This is th these two examples are what you do as a manager. Uh, and, and and by the way, and uh, you and I have talked about this, Bill. I guarantee you that there were 35 conversations exactly like these two that didn't get talked about, right? It happens all the time, every day. The excuse me, the major league manager today his, has a much bigger responsibility in the clubhouse than he does on the field. This is about managing people. And, and, you know, when you think about the fact that Kevin Cash is a great example. If you think about how Tampa plays, there's no, there's very few everyday guys there, right? This is a, uh, they platoon hitters. They use their pitchers in a really unique, different way. So, so play they're in different positions. Yes. And, and so that Bob Melman's another guy who's phenomenal at it. Having your players prepared for the day is a challenge in 162 game schedule. You know, guys don't want to show up to the ballpark and be surprised that they're not in the lineup. Guys don't want to show up at the ballpark and be surprised that they are in the lineup. And good managers don't allow that to happen. Tito was another one. Uh, they'll communicate with their players. And and Tito Millsy, Brad Mills, who was Tito's bench coach for decades, was great at this. They I, And I watched it happen. I watched it happen with Bo Mel in Arizona. They would come out the night after a game, after a game, and, and, and they would go to a different guy that might be playing to a Craig Council. Hey, you're playing third tomorrow. Maddie's got the day off. Or, or before a game, they would come into the locker room and tell Delucci or somebody on the bench, hey, listen, the way they're using their bullpen, you might get a pinch hit shot, seventh, eighth, be ready a little early tonight. Things like that. Players love that because players, like anybody else, you want certainty. You want to be assured of what your job is. Uh, leaving your players guessing, okay, that means you're in charge, but it it, it, it it decreases your chances of getting a productive effort from a player. And, and – you know, you, everybody says they're making millions, shut up and play. It doesn't work that way. Same way at your job. I don't care what you make per salary. You want to be respected. You want to, you want your value to be recognized. And it's hard to do when you've got a room full of 26 guys who were all the man and all, they're all alphas. And they're, you know, there's only eight of them that are in the playing field and on the playing field with the DH nine. And so you've got 10 guys or, you know, so you got eight position players at DH. You got nine players. And you got what, 13 pitchers? So you've got three or four guys who you have to manage. Uh, and they're just as important nowadays as any player on the bench because they're going to play. And over 162 game schedule, everybody's going to play. And you need to keep everybody in the right frame of mind. And I've said being a great manager today is about putting your players in a position to succeed mentally and physically. Um, and that takes us a, a different guy. Um, I thank God I never had to experience this. Um, this next situation, but, uh, and, and I hate as a pitcher, it kills me to talk about this. I remember, I don't know if you remember Bill Anthony Young for the Mets, who, uh, who I think lost like 20 straight decisions or something yeah. like that. Um, 
Jordan Lyles of the Royals, uh, and and I'm going to guess that Jordan Lyles is not completely at fault for this one. Fifteen straight starts, uh, they lost of his fifteen in a row. That's basically three months of baseball without your team winning a game. You start. Don't even want to imagine it. Can't even fathom it. He's one and eleven with a six six eight through sixteen starts. Um, I don't know what the mentality is. Never had to experience it. Uh, always felt like in those situations, I could will myself out of it. Um, but you're, when you're struggling on a horrible team, that's a combination of factors. Things happen. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. And that's um, that's a long and lonely three months is what that is. Uh, plus, the Royals are horrible. Yeah, they're not and- good. Well, and and again, that's a market that deserves far better from the ownership and it has never gotten, ever gotten the attention. That team has never gotten the attention it deserves from ownership for that fan base. Great fan base, great fans. I, a stadium I love to play in um, and a beautiful ballpark, but but uh, it ended. So Jordan is off the hook and hopefully he won't go another five starts without a win. Um, George Kirby, Mariners. Uh, uh, Kirby has 75 punch outs in 87 innings, and he's walked six guys when he enters Sunday start. That's 12 and a half strikeouts for every free pass, the best in the majors by a mile. He's nearly doubling up the next closest qualified starter, who's Joe Ryan, who's 6.67. Hasn't walked a batter in four games. Hasn't walked more than one in a game all season. He has a, currently has a single best strikeout to walk ratio of all time for a qualified pitcher. Now, uh, there are a couple guys that I played with um, and, and the, in the, on a season, his 12 and a half is the best ever. Phil Hughes of the twins, formerly the Yankees uh, has the best mark ever at 11, six Brett Saberhagen at 11 cliff Lee at 10.28 and some dude in 1884 was 10 to one, but that doesn't count because two strikes were a strikeout and like five balls were a walk. So um, pretty amazing. And, and that sort of stuff transcends trends. And by that, I mean, if you're a guy that that throws strikes and works and doesn't walk people, your velocity, for the most part, isn't as much of a relevant factor to your success um, because you have the ability to use the ball and move the ball in the strike zone in ways that other people can't. Well, the um, interesting thing with Kirby, too, is he doesn't rely entirely on his fastball. He's it's curves, it's sliders, it, it's, it's which makes it even more unique. Exactly. You know, you can under I can understand this from a sinker baller. A guy like Brandon Webb or Kevin Brown, who threw power sinker time after time after time. But a guy that has to do this mixing three or four pitches is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is a, this was, a, and strike out the walk ratio was a number I was always, always concerned about because, you know, the only thing that your defense can help you with is a walk. And the only thing you don't need your defense for is a strikeout. So, those are zero sum games when it comes to the pitches. Over 60% of his breaking pitches have been for strikes. 58% of his sliders, 62% of his curves. And, and I don't have context for that, but I promise you those are stunningly good numbers. Um, you know, if you think about it, I remember uh I, I led the league in first pitch strikes one year and I threw strikes 70% of the time with a fastball for the most part. This guy's closing in on 60 to 70% with his breaking stuff all throughout the count. That's kind of ridiculous. And, uh, but on the same line, uh, Max Scherzer, uh, after the fifth inning of Saturday's game, he was 94 pitches in. He went to the dugout and told Schultz that he was not coming out and wanted another inning. In the process, he made history. Scherzer now has the most starts of eight plus strikeouts with no more than one walk in major league history which is stunning. Max Scherzer at 120. He just passed Randy Johnson, 121. Clayton Kershaw with 108. Scherzer's 14 better, and I don't know that there's any end in sight. Um, but this is dominance, right? This is this is dominance for a guy, when you think about, again, the things that a pitcher can and can't control. When you talk about dominance, those are the, you know, ERA is a nice stat, but when you look at strikeouts to walks and hits the innings pitched and things like that, uh, this guy who is a first ballot hall of famer, clearly. And obviously, um, well, when I was watching this game, Kurt, it was really interesting after the fifth, he walked in and Buck walked up to him and you could read his lips and 
he in no no way, shape, or form didn't care that he had already thrown 94 pitches. He was pitching another half inning. And I'm going to throw this out there. I uh, don't know if it's true or not, but I'm going to bet, and I would comfortably bet that Max Scherzer knew this exact stat going into that game. Oh, yeah. I guarantee you he knew this exact stat going into <laughs> that game. Um, because of the way these things are pushed pushed to the, to the forefront media-wise, he knew going in. Uh, I know RJ was always about 10 punch outs. RJ was all, you could always, there was always a different look after that 10 strikeout. He was always about punching <laughs> out 10 guys in a game. Uh, and I became aware of it as well. I mean, I thought it was a big deal too. So yeah, they know, they know, but that's pretty amazing. Um, he just passed the most dominating strikeout pitcher of all time in Randy Johnson. Um, pretty amazing stuff. Um Speaking of pretty amazing, I, I don't even know where to go with this kid. Uh, Ellie Dela Cruz of the Reds, who has had pretty much the first best first two weeks in the history of baseball for a guy, uh, hit for the cycle the other day. He first since 1989 for the Reds. Eric Davis was the last guy. Youngest player in 51 years to hit for the cycle. Um, first player since 1903 to record 20 hits, five stolen bases, and three home runs in his first 15 career games, setting a mark not seen in the majors for more than a century. Again, we're going to cherry pick and find stats, but it's still pretty amazing. Um, and then and this is this is my favorite. There are only two players in history who hit for the cycle and stolen base at 21 years old. Ellie Dela Cruz and Mike Trout. And I think that that's what we're talking about from a uh, – a uh, talent level. Um, this kid, it, I mean, push aside the fact that he's six foot five and a middle infielder or an infielder and that, can that's, fly. Yeah, and he's probably up there with Otani as the fastest guy in the big leagues. Right. Pretty amazing, and and it's so cool to see the Reds being the Reds and and having that city get a little bit of a rebirth. That's a baseball city. It was a baseball city in the nineties. Uh, it was certainly a baseball city in the 70s with the big red machine in the 80s. Nice to see it coming back. Um, and then there are two guys that I said when I played um, who should have gone to the Hall of Fame for character alone. Uh, one of them's in, uh, Jim Tomey. And the other one uh, should have been in the Hall of Fame because of how much good he was for the game, Sean Casey. Uh, I mentioned those two names because this next note uh, is about Freddie Freeman, who I envisioned being the very same kind of guy, superstar talent, um, who's good for the game. He joins Cabrera, Joey Votto, Nelson Cruz, Elvis Andrus, and, and Andrew McCutcheon among active players who have accumulated 2,000 hits. He got his 2,000th hit the other day, uh, and he's the eighth, eighth Dodger ever to reach the mark. Congratulations to him and and one of baseball's good, good people. And he's the reason – that you want to have microphones on players during the game. He's the reason. Because if you haven't seen stuff, go to YouTube and check it out because it's hilarious. Um, and this one, uh, I'm going to tip my cap to John on this one, Bill. I didn't see this. Uh, this snuck up on me. Uh, me too. It's kind of a mind-blowing stat. Everybody, I, I will tell you right now, Ricky Henderson's the greatest leadoff hitter of all time, bar none. Um, he has the Major League Baseball record with leadoff home runs, 81. Basically, every day for half a season, he homered to lead off the game. Um, George Springer of the Blue Jays hit his 55th career leadoff home run, breaking a tie with Alfonso Soriano, another name that kind of caught me off guard in this category, to move into second place on the all-time leadoff home run list behind Henderson. He's 26 behind now. But uh, pretty special because when you think about traditional prototypical leadoff hitters, you don't think of home runs. Right. You think of, uh, oh, my God, the day D. Gordon homered after uh, uh, Fernandez passed away in Florida. D. Gordon, that was like his only career home run. You don't right. think of leadoff hitters as home run guys. Uh, but a guy that's done 55 times is clearly uh, to have to have that power and that on base ability to put you in the leadoff spot makes you special. And Ricky was the best and the most special of all time. Uh, just ask Ricky, because Ricky will tell you that Ricky in the third person was the greatest of all time. Um Great stat. Great stat. Um, finally, we're going to close it out with a list. Uh, and this is a very painful list for me to talk about. Uh, the top five hitters that I hated facing the most. And there are a lot of guys on this list 
and there weren't just five, but I narrowed it down to five. And my number one has never changed. Uh, the first two are the, the first two names on this list are guys who, uh, one's a lefty, one's a righty, and they were the guys I hated facing lefty righty the most. Um, at number one, with a career average of 333 off me, which might not sound that amazing, but he was 18 for 54. 11 of his extra of his hits were extra base hits. He had five home runs. Was Todd Helton? Uh, despised facing Todd Helton. I don't think he ever hit a ball soft off me. The one I remember most vividly is in Colorado. He was hitting, uh, I don't remember where the runners were, but I threw a 98 mile an hour fastball and I came up and in on him to kind of back him off the plate because I needed to get the inside part of the plate. And the next pitch was a 97 mile an hour fastball, almost in the same place. He swung and hit it so hard that Regal Bronio was at first base. He jumped to catch the ball and just missed it. And it and about a millisecond later, it went off the right field line fence for a double. It never rose more than eight feet off the ground and went straight to the right field fence for a double. And it was the hardest hit ball I've ever given up. Um, he was also the last hitter I faced in my career. Game two of the 2007 uh, World Series. Uh, I think subliminally I walked him on purpose. But I did walk him as my last hitter, uh, the last hitter I ever faced. 18 for 54, 11 extra bases, five home runs. The next guy had the same number of home runs in less than half the at-bats. Derek Lee was 11 for 26, six extra base hits, five home runs. Didn't have an answer. Didn't, didn't, had no answer for him. I didn't know what to throw him. I didn't know how to get him out and everything I threw. I, I'll never forget it either. So John Bukovic, my third base coach, used to be the guy who I'd go over my hitters with. And John would, I'll never forget him saying, hey, no, I think we could sneak a curveball in on him. So sure enough, uh, we're in Florida. I sneak a curveball in for a double, uh, if that's what could be called sneaking. Uh, and it was a good pitch. And I came back to the bench and, and I said, well, there goes the curveball. And he goes, yeah, but you hung that one. And I was <laughs> like, what? What the hell? No, I didn't. You know, it was like, it's not my fault. You threw it. So but Derek Lee, uh, 11 for 26, six extra base hits, five homers. Uh, nightmare. Uh, Frank Catalanato, he, when he was with the Blue Jays, I don't think I ever got him out. He was 11 for 22 off me, five extra base hits. He was a guy who just squared the ball up off me routinely. Uh, and then <laughs> Mark Lemke of the Atlanta Braves, 15 for 31. And if you know Mark, Mark was the size of Frodo Baggins. Um, with like high heels on 15 for 31. And I think he hit two of his four career home runs off me. Uh, I know he had two off me, but it, I played against Mark in the minor leagues. Outstanding ball player. Uh, could not get him out in the big leagues. He just wore me out. Um, and then the last guy, I'm going to claim that I use this as a setup. Um, Dave Justice was 10 for 28 off me with six extra bases. He had four home runs which forced the Yankees in 2001 to put him in the lineup when I had made adjustments and could now dominate him. So I think I, 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 I tricked them into playing him because I punched him out. I think the, all four times they saw him in the world series in Oh one. Uh, but he was put in there because he did own me uh, in the regular season. All that, all that was with Atlanta, but those Helton, Derek Lee, Frank Catalano, Mark Lemke and Dave justice. And there's other names. Bonds had nine home runs off me career but that was in over a hundred at bats. Um, and uh, there were other guys that, 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 uh, that had their numbers, but those guys were guys in my head. I knew when the lineup was coming up, I didn't have a whole, in my notebook there, there, it was usually their name in a blank space because I didn't have, I didn't have anything for them. Uh, really so. interesting. I mean, Hilton and Dave justice were career, very good hitters. The other three guys, right were solid hitters but yeah. not you know you're not putting those in the names of your era as no the guys. I mean, when you think about it, i had eddie murray one for 32 andre scalaraga i struck out i think 25 times in 30 some at bats um there were guys who i just Bizio bagwell their numbers i had good numbers against those guys but there are guys who just saw the ball better and, and if you notice uh the common thread between Catalan and Lemke, they were little guys. I yeah. had trouble with little. Marquise Grissom was another one I had a lot of trouble with early in my career. He owned me. Um, 
I had trouble with little guys because they were all good fastball hitters. And until I learned that the, that, that was the case, I, I didn't make adjustments, but, um, and there are, there are other names that belong. Dave Hansen was another one, big, extraordinary pinch hitter, extraordinary for the Dodgers. He, uh, he was a tough out for me as well. So, um, that's it. That's it for this week, guys. Um, always a pleasure. Let's, let's talk. And I want to mention, uh, uh, a note here. I, I close every show by saying check for outkick and, and the, the scroll, the screen, uh, on the front screen, go to the, the shows tab, um, wherever you get your podcast, you can now find us Apple, Spotify, uh, wherever you go to get your podcast, you can find the Kurt Schilling baseball show, uh, I'd like you to do it at outkick.com because that's who we work with and work for. And, and we want to continue making this place a, a bigger, presence in the sports market um and spotify as well uh apple everybody anywhere you get your podcast you can check us out we will be back on friday of this week uh don't know what the list is going to be but there will be a list uh so if you have any ideas send them to bill uh or me on twitter and we'll uh we'll, we'll get back to you with that one so bill have a great week uh i will catch up with you on friday my friend <laughs>